Hi, this is Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is carnal, all of that which is fleshly, all of that which is not true, and just seal to our hearts the truth of your word, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We are studying together in the epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we looked at the first three verses of chapter 1. This epistle is addressed by the Holy Spirit to the churches at Galatia, it is the one exception in the epistles in the New Testament where it doesn't single out saints, but it's addressed to the churches, plural, in Galatia. And I pointed out that there's a lot of argument about where that is. Essentially, there's a North Galatia and a South Galatia, and Bible students are somewhat divided between those who believe this epistle was addressed to churches in North Galatia and others who believe that it was South Galatia. And I don't know. What I do know is the Holy Spirit is the author and God Almighty engineered a situation where that the Holy Spirit would lead Paul to pen by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pen a strong defense for the gospel of the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The grace of God. There is something absolutely unique about Christianity. And that's why many times we've suggested that it's not a religion. There are all kinds of courses taken on comparative religion. Christianity is not a religion. All other religions are based upon what one does to gain merit with God. Christianity and Christianity alone is the only theology where God did it all, where man does nothing, nothing to gain merit with God. And that's just contrary to human logic. We know that those who work the hardest and do the best are the ones who attain the most. And we carry that sportsmanship, that athletic mentality, over into our religious philosophies, there is a tremendous effort in this age to bring together many religions of the world, minimizing any differences and maximizing anything that might appear to be the same. And surely, if ever there were a time in human history when it seems apparent that mankind is ready to accept one kind of modified religious philosophy, it's in this generation. And the Holy Spirit now is pinning a message to these churches to deal very, very soundly with the doctrine of grace. And the Holy Spirit wants us to know that it isn't just Paul. This isn't something that the Apostle Paul dreamed up. And that will become more apparent in the next few verses. This is the Word of God and it's addressed to the churches and grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. You know, it's difficult to put into words what it means to have peace with God. The astounding thing in my own personal experience is that, is that the one group of people who ought to have no argument whatsoever with God and who ought to have peace with God are those who have been redeemed through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it seems like even in that group of people, there is not much recognition of the grace and the peace of God. God's grace is evident in His extending His love toward us when we were not seeking Him when we were not working for Him, when we were not living for Him, 
when we did not love Him, when in fact we were His enemies and working against Him, and now we have peace with God. The fifth chapter of Romans, we went through that marvelous book. It begins, therefore having been justified by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. Imagine, God has nothing against you. That's the good news. God has nothing against you. Now on the basis of that, we begin in verse 4. Who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Our Father. Every word folks, in this verse, verse 4, is fraught with meaning. He gave Himself for our sins. The word gave there in the Greek is an aorist active participle. He really did it. And the importance of the participle in Greek grammar is that the action described by the participle precedes the action of the main verb. And at the very outset, we are told that whatever this deliverance is, it is impossible without the giving of Himself. He didn't give money. He didn't give effort. He didn't work to do something. He gave Himself. This is what we know as the substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word for there in your, in your verse, in that verse for, the word for, for our sins, is huper, which means in place of. There are a couple of ways that you can use the English word for. You could, you could lay out some clothespins and you could say, well, that's for, holding, that's for holding my pants up. But that's not the meaning of the word here. He gave Himself in our place. He did not provide some potential deliverance. He did it in our place instead of us Implicit in the expression is the obvious indication that if He did not die for your sins, you will. Those are the only two options. Now the question has to be, did the Lord Jesus Christ engage in a losing enterprise when He gave Himself for our sins? And what had happened at Galatia and what's happened in the modern church is... He, he did all He could do. Now the rest is up to you. But you see, dearly beloved, if you add anything to that, you reduce its significance to nothing. If it's Christ giving Himself in your place plus you doing anything, anything at all, then the fact that He gave Himself in your place is insignificant because the whole result hinges on what you do. But the argument here is that the entire result is based upon what He did. It doesn't matter what you do. You didn't ask Him to give Himself for your sins any more than Israel asked to be delivered out of the land of Egypt. It was God who undertook in, in our behalf to provide that which was necessary so that God could say, I have nothing against you. The immediate response of the human heart is, oh, that's, that's wonderful to say, but Steve, you don't know what I did. You don't know how I live. You don't know how I think. God has nothing against you. He gave Himself on behalf of us. Now, it doesn't say He gave Himself for everyone's sins, folks. I believe the popular Christian belief is that Jesus Christ died for the sins of every human being and those who will accept it go to heaven and those who reject it go to hell. Which means, if that were true, that Jesus Christ paid a horrible price that accomplished nothing for many, many people. This Bible does not teach any such concept as that at all. All we, like sheep, like sheep, have gone astray. Sheep. 
All his sheep have turned to their own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He gave himself for our sins. Who pair in our place on behalf of us? Now you can find verses where he gave himself for the sins of the world. I believe absolutely that Jesus Christ in his death on the cross removed Adam's condemnation and died in the place of those whom he chose. So the aorist participle says it precedes the main verb. The main verb is deliver, deliver, which means to pluck out, select for oneself, marvelous verb, in order that he might deliver. This, this is a purpose clause, a final clause, in order that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God, our Father. Our Father. He's your Father. He's your Father. Now let's look at this. The word world is age. It's not cosmos. It's aheon. Imagine a father who sits back and does absolutely nothing while his child goes to hell. And that's, that's pretty much modern Christianity. Stop and think for a moment. Our Father. Folks, if God is not your Father, you're not in this verse. And because of that obvious conclusion, there's a strong preaching of the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. That is not biblical. John Lennon. Okay? These which are born after the flesh, these are not the sons of God. The children of the promise shall be counted for the seed. God is our Father. And as a loving Heavenly Father, He provides for us. And the first thing, the first thing that is emphasized in this verse is He delivered us from this present evil age. The word deliver is not a present tense. It's tempting to say that He is delivering us. And we could get into all kinds of discussions about where God is in, in, in your delivering process, but it's an aorist tense. An aorist. That deliverance, that single deliverance is based upon the truth that Jesus Christ gave Himself in our place. That's the substitutionary doctrine of redemption by grace. He died in your place. He didn't die to provide something for you that you could use in order to bring about your redemption if you wanted to. He died in your place. If He died in your place, you cannot die and therefore you are delivered from this present evil age. Grand truth. Age. The word age. Uh, Aheon is some, sometimes translated world. It's sometimes translated age. It's the present, the word present. There's, a, there's actually a participle, and it's in the perfect tense. There is some argument about what the present age is. I think it began with the fall, and, and it ends with a new creation. The word evil is, is that familiar word poneros. It's where we get our word porneo, por, porn. Uh, there is, I believe, a significant reason why the Holy Spirit chose the words that He did. A man can be evil and that's it. Or a man can be evil and not be content without making others evil with him. That is, he wants others to become as evil as he is. The difference is between kakos the word kakos in this word is one who's evil and content to be evil and doesn't care about whether you're evil or not. But the paneros man is a man who is not only evil but intends to bring you down with him. And that's this present evil age. It is an age that is pitted against God. The prince and the power of the air is Satan himself. We can sit back in our understanding of the sovereignty of God and we can realize that Satan can do nothing unless God permits him or engineers it to be done. But let's don't minimize the conflict. Sin is so serious to God that He became incarnate and died in our place 
to deliver us from this present evil age. It isn't something that we should take lightly. Various religions, various religious leaders all bent on uniting so that we won't have all of these differences. That is, folks, that is the characteristic of the present evil age. The age is evil. Evil is the word porneo, from which we get the word pornography. We, we get the wrong idea, though, with the word porneo. Don't think, do not think that evil is always sexual and erotic and everything rather than philosophical. The great danger of this age, and please, don't, do not misunderstand me. The, the great danger of this age is not pornography. It's the adulteration of philosophy. It is the idea that man can bring about an appropriate solution, that man can come up with a religion or a philosophy that works, that man has something to do with his goodness and with his redemption. That is the evil that is pervading the Galatian churches, plural, the idea that Christ started something that man must finish. You know, what gets you to heaven is the fact that Jesus Christ gave Himself for your sins by dying in your place and God delivered you. Not is delivering, not in the process of that. He's delivered you. God delivered you from this present evil age, says the text, and He did that according to your will? No. No. According to, it says, the will of God. Read it. The will of God, even our Father. Now, now, many, many religions would strongly agree that God is their Father, but they leave out all that which precedes. I don't want to get into any name-calling. You can, you can think of the various philosophies. Roman Catholicism would, would agree totally that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you accept and if you believe and if you are water baptized and if you don't commit any certain offenses, well, then maybe you'll go to heaven. You know, you might spend some time in purgatory because God has some little thing against you, but you're going to go to purgatory. You see, all of those things are evil, but they would not deny the death of Jesus Christ for sin. They wouldn't deny that. The Mormon God is not the father of this verse. It is a loving heavenly father who provided for you and who cares for you, who disciplined you, who works in your life both to will and to do of his good pleasure, as hard as that seems sometimes. So that as, as hard-headed as we are, we might slowly learn that by his grace we've been justified by the faithfulness of Christ. You are not justified by your faithfulness. You are not made acceptable to God by your works. But because Jesus Christ gave Himself in your place, that made it possible for God to deliver you from this present evil age. The evilness of this age is man's goodness, man's work, humanism. And folks, it pervades Christianity. Good ministers have labored in the truth of the Word of God and they see Christians living so carelessly that they're forced to say, well, there's got to be something wrong. There's got to be something more. You have to do something to show that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The temptation, in fact, is so strong to add your works to the finished work of Christ. Dearly beloved, that is the evilness of this age. That's the great effort to bring down redemption by grace and by grace alone. I am persuaded that the redemption through faith is through the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The modern Christian message is according to our will. You know, Will you accept? Will you receive? Will you believe? And the text says, according to the will of God. 
The design purpose of God is your deliverance from this present evil age. You think God willed it and couldn't bring it to pass? It's, it is human logic that looks out at what we call the Christian community and says, well, it's, it's obvious that God never overrules the human will. And folks, I challenge you to find a passage of Scripture, a single verse that would support such an idea. But that's modern Christianity. You are delivered from this present evil age because God willed it, not because you willed it, not because you chose it, not because you did one single thing. It was according to the will of God. The will of God. The verb here is translated as might deliver, aorist subjunctive, that he might deliver. It is, in fact, because of the English that people preach a synergistic gospel that he'd, well, he'd like to deliver, but he can't unless you agree. And that's why it's translated might deliver. And that's simply not true. It is a misunderstanding of Greek grammar. This is a purpose clause. It happens to be a final clause, but final clauses are purpose clauses. Pur purpose clauses require, this, they require that subjunctive mood in order that he might deliver. You couldn't use the grammar any other way. You know, in the e English language, if you express a condition contrary to fact, you are required to use the first person plural. You know, if, if we were going to go downtown, but, but people don't do that, you, you, you know, if you're going, uh, if, if, you know, if it's, well, it's not if he was, go, was going downtown. You have to use the plural if he were going downtown. Yet everybody says, if he was going downtown. He, He'd do this. Now, that's, that's English grammar. Greek grammar says we use a subjunctive mood in purpose clauses. And since it's subjunctive, then it's translated might deliver. The text also says we might be made, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ, but we are. I do not believe from a final clause you should conclude that He may or He may not deliver. That's not the meaning of a purpose clause. His purpose was in order to deliver, and he didn't fail. The grammar requires a subjunctive mood. Our God is a loving Heavenly Father. He's a God whose compassion is as far above ours as the heavens is above the earth. In Corinthians, He's the God of all comfort. He's the one that comforts us with a comfort that passes understanding. This is our Father. Now what the Galatian churches were being told is that what Jesus Christ did, what He did was good, but you have to keep the law. Therefore, you have to gain merit with God. And here is a Father who says, if you don't do this, I'll send you to hell. No. Can't be. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He gave Himself in our place for our sins. Whosoever is born of God does not sin, for His seed abides in Him, and He cannot sin. I am not suggesting, I am not suggesting that you are sinlessly perfect in your old man. You are sinlessly imperfect. That's all you do. That's all the old man does. That's all the old creation does is sin. Never did it do anything good. It may look good on the outside, but the motive will, will show it to be evil. But the new creation, the new man, based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, has his seed remaining in him so that he cannot sin according to the will of God. To whom, and the word be is not there, the be isn't there, to whom glory forever and ever. Amen. So let it be so. To Him glory forever and ever. Amen. That, that's our God. And in the very opening paragraph of this epistle, we have one of the strongest 
declarations of redemption by grace in all the Word of God. There was no synergism in the entire verse. There isn't anything in the we or the, the our or the us. Nothing that, that the we, our, or us did in verse 4. It was God who did it according to His own will. He's our Father. To Him glory be forever and ever. Amen. And so the Holy Spirit goes on in verse 6. I stand utterly amazed. And it's not an arrest. I am continually amazed, amazed that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The word uh, so soon there is, is tachios, from which we get the word taxi, and it carries with it the idea of in a hurry. In the book of Revelation, it's used in the sense of once things start, then let them continue on very quickly. Now we have the same problem here in verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What He could be saying, what the Holy Spirit could be saying, is that I am utterly astounded that when I was there preaching in those churches, you know, he's, he's having Paul say this. When I was there preaching in those churches, I preached redemption by grace, and I'm utterly astounded in the weeks that followed how quickly that you have moved away from that gospel. Now that's, that's what he could be saying. I don't think that's what he's saying. There is another possibility. I'm going to lean toward the second possibility, which doesn't make it true at all, but the, the second possibility is that I am utterly amazed at how soon the minute that you hear the addition of works, how quickly you agree with it, and how prone that you are to move away from the gospel of the grace of God unto another. That's not another gospel. Now, I'm not sure that's what that means, but that's what I think he means. I don't think he's talking about the time that intervenes between when Paul was there uh, on a missionary journey and the, the present moment. I think the Holy Spirit is saying it is absolutely astounding how quickly you can move away from the truth when you hear error. And I don't think that's unusual. Who wants truth? It's error that's exciting. and It's error that flourishes. Truth, you know, that, that would make news. Truth, fundamental truth, doesn't make good news, but it's good news to us. It wasn't intended to be good news to those who were not His. There is something in the human that is prone to error. And I think what the Holy Spirit is saying here, He's having Paul say, I'm astounded at, at how quickly you move away from truth. You are so soon removed, and that is a present tense, being removed from Him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The word another there is heteros. We, there's alos and there's heteros. That which is alos is a different of the similar kind. Heteros is another of a different kind. And so he says here, I am utterly amazed that you are quickly moving away from Him that called you into the grace of Christ And you see, when you move away from the grace of Christ, you, you move away from Him that called you. But those are inseparable. If you move away from the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ, redemption by grace, you move away from Him that called you unto another gospel. A heteros gospel. A different gospel. Another gospel gospel of a different kind. 
You know, uh, the gospel, we, we translate it evangelize. So if, if you were to literally translate this, him that calls you into the grace of Christ into a different good news, you know, we have all kinds of jokes. I have, I have you know, you've heard, you've heard this. I've, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. You know, what do you want to hear first? But how can you have different good news? You know, this guy has good news. I have a different good news, and that can't be. And that's why he goes on with the next verse. It isn't, in, in fact, different good news. It's not good news at all. That's why the expression different good news doesn't really make any sense. The world is saying this is good news, that you have to do something in order to be redeemed. That, believe me, is not good news. How would you ever know if you did enough? That's the problem with a different good news, with the good news that includes something man has to do. How do you know whether you've ever done enough? Or how do you know whether you've ever kept on doing enough? That's, that's always the problem with law. I am astounded that you'd be removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. Listen, I, I can't imagine that anybody would move away from the grace of Christ. I can't, I can't imagine that anyone would entertain a thought that would move them away from the good news, the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. What a marvelous, marvelous truth. And yet, they were quickly removed to a gospel of works. Folks, the theme of this epistle so far fits right into every epistle or book that we've ever studied on this channel. I invite you to go take time to read Romans 8 right now. Read Romans 8 and, and see how it fits in. Plugs right into all of it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I pray for you all constantly. Please keep us in your prayers for the direction of this ministry. Keep looking it up. Our Lord is coming back soon. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.